Welcome back to Municipal. Game two, Post University, Chestnut Hill College. You know the deal. These two teams just faced off about 30 minutes ago. And we saw history here at Municipal with Matt Seaman getting the first no-hitter, presumably in program history. We had, had some correspondence with the Chestnut Hill SID Bob Heller, who's been around for several decades within the CACC, who said he can't recall that anything else happened. There was a, uh, looks like A.J. McNamara, the, one of the former head coaches and current assistant uh, athletic director here at Post, also just texted that Mitch Ferber threw a five-inning shortened no-no in 2009, but thinks there might have been another shortened one. However, that was the longest then, if that's the case, no matter what, the longest complete Complete game no-hitter in terms of going the full length. But we're ready for game two. Brennan Holligan on the mound for Post University. Making one of the few starts that he has. This is only his second start, actually. He's got the lowest ERA on the team. Two, two flat, two and one record. Seven appearances, one start, two saves. That one's in there for strike three. No, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's low for a ball, too. Seven appearances, one start, two saves, 18 innings pitched, 16 hits, nine runs, four of those earned, 10 walks, 22 strikeouts, and one home run allowed. That one's going to be chopped over to the left side. What a beautiful dive by Evan Cornwell. And that's going to be the first hit of the double header for Chestnut Hill. It's Aiden Myers, the designated hitter, leading off with that. And so Chestnut Hill breaks a streak of seven consecutive innings without a hit between against post, excuse me. And as we ready ourselves for game number two, the starting lineups. Aiden Myers, Justin Geiger as they look to sack bunt there. Justin Geiger, that was. John Crane, RJ Huth, Alexander Fascia, Phoenix Bowman. Calvin McCall, Dan Ciotti, Sean Levan are your starters for Chestnut Hill. Same exact defensive alignment in everything for post in game number two from left to right. It's Karen, Gil, Pavelchak on the infield, Rivera, Cornwell, Keller, Corchado, Brennan behind the dish, Holligan on the mound. So there's what you've got going for you. On both sides. And it is the exact same lineup we saw in game number one for Post University as well. One through nine and then Holligan on the mound. Who's ahead 0-2 in the count and gets Geiger down swinging. First out of the inning. John Crane who had some big booming hits in the first game but wasn't able to get that elusive lone hit of the game for Chestnut Hill. As Matt Seaman, like we've mentioned a couple times now, first no-hitter in program history. Wild pitch there by Holligan is going to advance the runner to second. Myers now standing on second, 180 feet away from scoring the first run of the game. Post now 7-3 and three on the year when scoring first. That was also, I got to double-check this, but I'm about 99% sure. I'm looking at the stats right in front of me, so... Let me just confirm it. Second shutout of the year. It's in their first strike. Yeah, that's right. They had the one against Queens earlier this year. It was Joe Christiana and Nate Bird combining in that one. 1-1 one, one count. Lined up the middle. That's going to fall in for a... No, that's not. That's going to be caught. Danny Gill charged in on that one, and from this depth and this angle, it looked to me that Gill was not going to be able to get there in time, but he does. Slides to grab it. Two down here in the first. That saved potentially runners on the corners with one out. And R.J. Hoot, the center fielder. <clears throat> Excuse me, batting cleanup this game. Again, ready, fires in there for strike one.
Again, umpire switch between games. So that's Nick Barone behind the plate calling balls and strikes. Mike Williams on the base, base path. In a 1-1 count for Holligan. He deals. Low for a ball. Two and one the count. The only other game of the day for Post Athletics, the women's lacrosse team going to get set to play Caldwell in about 40 minutes from now. That one swung and a miss. Count moves to two and two. Eagles now three and three on the year. It was the first time they lost this year when getting 10 plus goals in a game. However, they are 0 and three when allowing 10 or more goals in a game. Interesting numbers early on in the year. It was also their first loss in the rain. They were two and one in the rain this year. Excuse me, two and zero oh in the rain. Now they're two and one in the rain. Three two count coming from Holligan to Huth. Runner on second. Runners in scoring position, you know, I say Matt Seaman had a no-hitter in game one, but runners in scoring position were plentiful for Chestnut Hill in the first few innings of game number one. And Brennan going to be caught sleeping there. I believe that will go down as a passed ball because they did go right into his glove and then it just trickled away. So it goes as a walk for sure. Runner moves over to third. Runners on the corners now for... Chestnut Hill, and we saw this a ton of times in game number one where Chestnut Hill had runners on the corners, runners on second and third, a runner on first and third. It was just they had so many different ways to score, but they weren't able to get the hit to do it. Matt Seaman ran into a lot of trouble early on, and once he got his groove, he was hard to stop. Stealing second or trying to, and now it's going to be a rundown, 2-6-3, and they got him. He's out of the baseline, 2-6-3. And that run's not going to count. So the, the point of that, for those of you at home, was to try and get the throw down to second in order to have the runner break for home. The problem was is Myers didn't break for home on the initial throw. And the point is then to get caught in that run down long enough for the run to cross the plate. Because if the run crosses before the outs recorded in the base paths like that, it's, an, it, it's a run scored, then it's the final out of the inning. However, Myers didn't break for home soon enough. By the time he did, the rundown was already complete. He was caught out of the baseline. And that's how the cookie crumbles for Chestnut Hill to start things off. Important thing to note, too, if you have not watched baseball before, you're unfamiliar with stuff, it's not the same as the final out of an in inning on a ground out. If the ball was grounded to the shortstop and the run came in, it would not be a put out, or excuse me, not be a run scored no matter what. But this this is a special case when that sort of thing happens. Run did not score, though. And as we get ready for the bottom of the first, from left to right, Ciotti will be in left. It'll be Huth in center, McCall in right, similar to game number one. Not entirely the same, but Geiger will be at third. Levan at short. At second will be Bowman. At first, Crane. Behind the plate doing the catching, Fascia. And then on the mound is Ben Bratt. Bratt comes into this game with a 1-1 one one record, 5 appearances, 2 starts, 7.59 ERA, 10 and 2 thirds innings pitched, 16 hits, 10 runs, 9 of those earned, 6 walks, 10 strikeouts, giving up 4 home runs, 1 double, Opponents hitting 340 against him. He'll get ready to face the same lineup from game number one. It was a 4 nothing win for Post. They've struggled to score more than three runs in a lot of their games this year, and they've started to do it in recent, recent games. But even in doing so, the 11-1 win had a lot of offensive firepower to it. These last couple of games that they've had, their runs have come via error and other mishaps by fielding. Luckily, though, they have started to get the bats going where they've gotten the runners in scoring position and have had the potential for hits, and they've cashed in when need be. But they haven't really they haven't really even reached, I would say, their full potential offensively. 
And that's kind of a scary thing. The pitching has started to figure it out as the year went on, as the pitch is high to Pavelchak to start off the bottom of the first. The pitching hasn't quite got there yet. Or, excuse me, the pitching has started to come around. It's the offense that hasn't quite come around yet. But they're starting to piece it together slowly but surely. And in doing so, that makes for a dangerous combination as the year goes on. As long as your pitching's on par, you're going to be in games. But once the offensive bats get swinging, you're going to see a team that's going to be able to compete not only just within the CACC, but potentially for a regional, depending on how things shake out the rest of the year, as that one's in there for strike two to Pavelchak. As a team, post hitting 249, so not bad for a team average. So one two from Brad coming in now. High ball two. Only two players hitting above 300 though. Chris Corchado and Michael Pavelchak. Jimmy Brennan hitting 291, and then from there it kind of falls off. And so that's the thing. Once some of these bats that may be hitting a little no lower than they're normally used to start to get going, this is going to be an all-around tough team to beat. DJ Karen at 280 right now. Cornwall at 263, Rivera 239, 171 for Gill and Keller at 143. That's been pretty much your starting nine, game in and game out. So once Gill and Keller's bats can get going, because they've seen ample at bats, once this lineup's hitting one through nine, they're going to be a tough team to beat as time goes on. Although I would watch out too from the South Division. Holy family, their first year competing has been red hot to start and winning a lot of games early on. That'll be an interesting one to watch from the south. The Wilmington's kind of struggled to start the year. There's a lot of good competitive teams in the CACC. It's only going to get harder as the year goes on. Brad knocks that one down. Pavelchak's going to reach safely. That should go down as a hit. As there really wasn't too, too much Pavel, uh, excuse me, Brad could do with that to try and, you know, make a stop on it. It was a nice chopper back to him. Pavelchak's got speed. I would look for him to run here, potentially. Eagles did score first in game number one. 7-3 this year when they do that. It's an important stat to note. They are now 11-14 after the game one win. 3-1 and one is the big one, though, in conference. Eagles 11-14 overall, 3-1 and one in conference. Chestnut Hill 7-16, 1-5 in conference. Chestnut Hill got their first conference win yesterday in game one of their doubleheader against Bridgeport. That was outside for a ball. Count moves to 2-0. and oh. Run on first with the leadoff single for Pavelchak. Cornwell now stepping in. And that one's going to be outside throw wide. He's going to be safe. Pavelchak, like I mentioned, probably steal, and he does. 3-0 the count. And now a runner in scoring position for Post here with nobody out in the first inning with Bratt on the mound. It'll be Corchado due up next. Brennan in the hole. Brennan and Pavelchak, I mentioned this last time I was on the, the broadcast, both over 150 hits on the years. That one's in their first strike, so Brat gets one back there. They're both going to be competing back and forth potentially as they go up the list in chase of Dan Luisi for most hits all time. Of course, when Luisi did it, it was still wood bats, and now it's changed to metal, which does make a difference, but nonetheless... Still something to watch for in the all-time history of post. You may see your first 200 career hit hitter as well. DJ Karen does come into his post career with already 200 hits, but that, most of those hits came against Nichols, or excuse me, with Nichols College for the four-plus years that he was there. So now that he's moved over here, yeah, they count towards his career, but they don't count towards Post's all-time history. Kind of like if you already have 1,000 points when you come to a university for maybe a grad year or something, you don't count towards the list as being Post's, you know, whatever, 1,000 score. As Cornwell goes outside with that one, wasn't biting on it from Brat, and he'll go down to first. 
I'll bring Corchado to the plate with first and second. Nobody out here in the bottom of the first. Cloudy sky is still expecting potentially some rain showers later. It really wasn't a definite in the forecast, but let's not put that out into the air right now since we still have baseball to be played here. That one's in there for a strike. Starting earlier, too, in this one, we started just around 320. Originally, the game one was scheduled to start at noon. Got pushed to one. Both were seven innings no matter what. But we started early because of how quick game one went. You would have assumed it would probably start around eh, now or even like four o'clock. But everything got pushed up because of the spectacular work of Matt Seaman in game one. Getting what's presumed to be the first no-hitter in program history in terms of going a complete length of a game, of a scheduled game. That one's outside for a ball. Count moves to 1-1. One one. Brad's been taking his time on the mound in this first inning in terms of delivering the pitch. That one's low for a ball, two and one the count. Right, really taking his time in between pitches, and that one's delivering. Corchado follows it off. So count moves to two and two. Runners on first and second. Still nobody out here in the bottom of the first inning. Holligan worked a pretty quick top of the first, and Brad has significantly slowed down the speed of this game in this inning so far with the time he's taking looking in for a pitch from his catcher and to come set and deliver. Now he does, and that one's low for a ball, three and two. Both teams with a hit so far. After the Griffins were unable to record a hit in all of game number one. Brat nearly had a pickoff play at second but Pavelchak slides in safely and we'll wait some more for this pitch coming on the 3-2 count Brat sets and fires home chopped foul by Corchado and we'll do it once more Looking at the CACC North Division standings, Post is atop of them right now at 3-1. and one. Dominican right behind them at 2-1. and one. Felician 3-2, Caldwell 3-2, Bridgeport 2-3. Bloomfield finally played their first conference game and game of the year and lost, it looks like, 22 to nothing. So they're 0-1 one and, and to start the year. In the South Division, Holy Family, like I said, a surprise. Corchado lifts that one in the center field, ranging back to grab it. Near the warning track was Huth. Pavelchak up to third. So runners on the corners, two outs here in the bottom of the first. Holy Family, who I mentioned, who's been a bit of a surprise, but also like a dark horse because it is their first year. You never know what to expect with the first year program and what they're going to be able to do. Holy Family off to a 4-1 and one start. Goldie Beacom, 2-1. and one. Jefferson, 3-3. Three and three. Chestnut Hill, 1-5. and five. And Wilmington, who's been regionally ranked, Three-game losing streak. They're 0-3 in conference play right now. So, interesting to see there right now. It's almost like a reversal of what you expect. You wouldn't have expected, I think, personally. Again, I don't know too, too much about that. But when you when you talk about a first-year program, you always don't know what you're going to get out of it, like I just mentioned a minute ago. 
you almost would have expected Wilmington and Holy Family to be reversed early on in the year. But, again, there's nothing. That's not discrediting Holy Family whatsoever as that pitch is in there for a strike. It just goes to say they have performed really well for a first-year program, which is good to see a program be able to get off to such a fast start like that. You don't always see that with college athletics. We've had our fair share of programs here at post start out from the ground and not have immediate success, and it's taken time to build. And so it's important to recognize when you see a first-year program like that being able to do that. It's a little bit unexpected, but it's good to see. Brat coming with the 1-1 count. Looks in and fires. Count chops it over to short. I think that was caught on the dime. Yep, it was. And that's going to be a double play. LeVan with a beautiful dive. Able to get the out in the outfield, excuse me, at short on the dive and throw it over to first to double off Cornwell. So the Eagles don't get anything out of that. No runs, one hit, one left on base. And at the end of one, 0-0 zero, zero here. Second inning, nothing, nothing here. One hit apiece for each team in the first, but no runs came across. Leading off this inning is going to be Fascia. Catcher getting the starting game number two. Alexander Fascia, the junior from Brampton, Ontario. You don't see too many Canadians in the game down this way, but he is the lone actual, actually he's the lone Canadian on this team. It's fouled off, and he's behind the count 0-2. It's always interesting when you see athletes on some of these rosters and see where their hometown is from as Holligan delivers just outside and how they find some of these smaller schools that they may not have known about. Like we have here at Post some players from overseas like, to my left right here is Bianca Stiles from, you probably heard her a couple weeks ago on the women's basketball, bro, or the men's basketball broadcast. Like, she's from New Zealand. It's just interesting how you can have people from all over the road. We've got a few of our women's lacrosse players from Poland, how they're able to find these small schools like Post and choose to come here. Fasia lifts that one in the air into the gap. Pavelchak dives, not going to be able to get it. Gill's over to grab it. Into second safely with a double. Is Fascia to lead it off, so the Canadian hits one deep into the gap, and he's on with nobody out here to lead off the second inning. I mean, even if you look at the post-university roster, you've got a few kids from California and a few from the Dominican Republic as well who have hopped aboard head coach Ray Scold's team.
Skold now with a 82 and 82 record overall at post with that game one win. Is that one's in their first strike? Oh, and won the count. Chestnut Hill threatened in the first with runners on the corners yet again. This has to be, I want to say, the, the fifth inning as Corchado's way in, expecting the bunt. It's bunted foul. This has to be at least the sixth or seventh inning, I want to say, that post, excuse me, Chestnut Hill has put a runner in the scoring position with under two outs. And they have not been able to cash in. Of course, like I mentioned, like Matt Seaman had a no hitter in game one. So clearly they weren't getting it done with the bats because he was stifling them there. But even when they were able to get runners on other ways, nothing was doing. As Holligan now has a pickoff play, one, five, one, five, four, tagged him on the butt. That's going to be a 1-5-4 caught stealing for Fascia, who was caught looking, but he motioned towards third. So 1-5-4 caught stealing for Fascia. And that'll be the first out of the inning. Then the rundowns always get interesting, especially when they run really long trying to figure out who went to where. And that one swung on and missed. Bowman tagged out, two down. I can recall way back in the day when doing some official scoring for summer ball, where there was a there is a rundown that went between so many batters, excuse me, so many fielders that it actually the the program couldn't physically record how many numbers it went through. I believe it was through ten different players, as that one's in their first strike, to McCall. It went through about 10 different fielders until they finally got the rundown done. It was something like 9 2 4 5 2 3. It, it went everywhere within the field. Nearly every person touched the ball. And the, the stat system was unable to record it fully because of how many characters the program was allowed to input at that time. And no, if you're listening at home and are an SID in the field and whatnot, it was not stat crew. It was point streak. One two count coming after that foul ball by McCall. Hall again looking to get out of this inning after a nice pickoff move and then the strikeout. One's outside for a ball. Count moves to two and two. Hall again working quickly. Outside for a ball, three and two. It'll be interesting to watch as this game goes on the contrast between the speed of the two pitchers in terms of how fast they work. Bratt in the bottom of the first worked very, very slowly. And Holligan seems to just lock in and fire, and he's ready to go. And he locks in and fires that one for strike number three. McCall down looking. We head to the bottom of the second. No runs, one hit, no errors, no one left on base. We're tied here at zero. After.
DJ Karen leading things off here to start the bottom of the second post. Tied at zero. I believe that's still number 36 behind the plate. I saw him shake hands with the ump, and it's the second, so that's why. I, no, that's a different catcher. It's a different catcher than what we had listed. That ball is low and in the dirt. So that's not Fascia. Yeah, so Christian Peluso, the game one starting catcher, is now in. I wonder if something happened to Fascia in that rundown. As that one's chopped towards the middle, that'll be a base hit for Karen as the outstretched arm of Bowman was unable to get it. Now Karen in the second. He, wow, catches Chestnut Hill sleeping. He's going to have a double on the play. But as I was saying, I think something may have happened potentially to Fascia that caused him to have to come out of the game on that rundown. He caught, caught kind of awkwardly between the, uh, between the fielders. But DJ Karen with a unorthodox leadoff double as he caught the fielder sleeping for Chestnut Hill. And now you've got that shift that I think we saw. Yeah, this is the same shift we saw for Justin Rivera in game one. The center, the second baseman, and that's going to be a high pitch. It's probably going to be a wild pitch, moving Karen to third. But if you notice, the second baseman is way over. That's Bowman. He's literally like at second base in terms of where he's playing. So I... I Rivera is able to poke it through the shift on the right side. He could probably even push bunt it into that open space if he wanted to. And instead he's going to pop that one, and that's not going to be deep enough to get a run. Bowman right in the position to get it. And that's one away. Karen stuck on third. But like I was saying, Rivera would have had the potential to like possibly push it to that side because if you force the first baseman to come off in that situation and grab the ball, you then put your pitcher in a situation where he's got to cover first and try and outrun Rivera because the second baseman's not going to be able to come over and save you because he's way over in center field, essentially, and he's still there. So they have, they know something about these eagle hitters, and they're shifting that way as Bowman remains there. So if I'm Jalen Kelly, I would love to try and see if you can just push something to that left right side which is wide open right now and ripe for the taking. That one's going to be in there for a strike, though. Count moves to one and one. One and one to count to Kelly. Swung on and missed. One and two. Be a big strikeout here for Brat if he could get it. Reason being is with one out and the runner on third, a sack fly would score the run and give Post a one nothing lead. And as we know, they are 7-3 and three this year, one leading first. Pitch high for ball two. Brat has started to pick up the pace, I will say, in the second inning compared to the first. It's probably just a feeling out thing. Kelly chops that one off his foot, I think, or at least off the shin guard. And the count remains two and two. Kelly got his first collegiate hit here at post a few weeks ago against Palm Beach Atlantic. Has played more regularly now this year as he was coming off an injury for the last couple of years. And in his third season with the team, he's been seeing a starting role as of late in the DH spot. As he's going to go down looking, and he didn't like that call, but it doesn't matter. That's the way it goes down. And now Hunter Keller will try and see if he can get across that run from Karen, who had heads up base running to get the second with no one out for a double. See what he can do. Brat. At 31 pitches coming into the said bat. Pitch in there for, nope, a low pitch that I <laughs> I thought was going to be called a strike. In game number one, that, that call was there by Mike Williams at times. So that'll be ball one, one and know the count. Again, scheduled seven inning game here. Game one was seven innings, this one's seven innings, that one's in there for a strike, one and one. 
Keller's one of those guys that I told you was struggling so far with the bat, hitting under 200, but once he starts to get going, this Eagles team just gets that much more dangerous, especially as the pitching has started to kind of come around. Keller's going to chop the one at the middle. Bowman, who is ranging over, is there and throws over to first. He's retired. Inning over. No runners get across. Karen has the leadoff double go by the wayside. We head to the third inning. We are tied at 0-0. And we're back here in the third inning. I'm joined alongside Grace Glassroon now for this one. Grace, welcome to the broadcast. Thanks. <laughs> you told me that you know nothing about baseball Pretty coming much. into today. Yeah. What do you know about baseball? Um, the simple things. You hit the ball. You don't want to get it caught while it's in the air. Um, there's strikes, fouls, there's balls, there's a strike zone. And that's an out and that in left is. field by DJ Karen. So one down here right away. That was Ciotti retired in left field by Karen. One away, and that'll bring up Levan, the shortstop. So who's your favorite player on the post-baseball team? Uh, being honest, I don't know really anyone on the baseball team, but I heard Matt Seaman had a great game earlier, so I'll go with him for right now. So we're just going with the hot hand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No bias there at all. No, no, no. Matt, you're Grace's guy of the day so far in terms of favorite player. We'll see if that changes with Brennan Holligan's start as he fouls that one off back to the screen, and it goes to one and one. LeVan started at shortstop in game number one, although – Made an error in terms of putting it in. We thought that Richard Joel was in for the first few innings until we figured that one out. It happens. It happens. We all make mistakes. Exactly. Everybody has those days. <laughs> <laughs> What's outside for a ball? Three and one. Holligan delivers. That one's going to be popped into left center, excuse me, right center. Pavelchak ranging over, makes the grab, loses the hat, catches the hat. And that doesn't count as two outs, but it does get one out, and it gets two outs on the board overall, and post one out away from getting out of this third inning. So something we noticed as the players were going out on the field was that everyone has a baseball hat on. Do you know if that's a rule, that they all have to wear a baseball hat while they're out in the field? We're not sure. <laughs> We're assuming so, though. Like just being part of the uniform or something like that. Yeah, yeah. we're we're pretty sure that is a rule, although we have our <laughs> sports communications assistant, Kristen Brown, former four-year Gordon College softball player, 
who knows very well, and we know from watching post softball, you don't need to wear a hat in softball. You don't even need to wear protective gear on the mound if you don't want to, but most pitchers like herself probably did opt to do that. Yeah, she just <laughs> nodded yes. And then you can also wear a sweatshirt over your jersey as long as it has the number on the back, which you cannot do in baseball, which is why you see a lot of the players wearing long sleeves underneath their shirts because that's all they're allowed to do. I do also see number seven, Hunter Keller, wearing a sweatshirt underneath because he's got his little hood sticking out. <laughs> Cornwell <laughs> retires the runner at first in Corchado, and that'll end the top of the third. It's still nothing, nothing, but we're not going to head to break. Grace, we have baseball questions for you. Yeah, I didn't tell you this before the game. We have 11 trivia questions on the no. screen right here. And we're going to start off with a nice easy one. So on the screen right now, which post coach won a gold medal in the Olympics? Was it Ray Skold, Gretchen Silverman, or Dylan Bell? Oh, that's Gretchen Silverman. Yeah, that's your head coach. Yeah, we yeah, wanted yeah, to make yeah. sure you knew that one. Oh, yeah, the MVP of the USA-Canada uh, <laughs> Cup game on the ice. And then what baseball players made CACC honor roll this week? Was it Joe Christiana and Jimmy Brennan, Jalen Kelly and Matt Seaman, or Jimmy Brennan and Michael Pavelchak? It was the first option. It was. It yeah. was. Good. Okay, so you're two for two. This one might be harder. Which coach, which current post admin is the former head baseball coach? Is it Mike Brianza, Ronnie Palmer, or A.J. McNamara? I'm going to guess AJ. It is AJ. He was the coach in the late 2000s and early 2010s, and he's probably watching right now. Yeah, I was only guessing that because he was at the games last week while I was here. <laughs> <laughs> now we get into the harder ones. Who signed the largest contract in MLB history this offseason? Was it Pete Rose, Derek Jeter, or Shohei Otani? It's the last one for the Dodgers, right? Yes, yeah. it was Shohei Otani. Yeah. Yes. I know the team. I want to make I, sure, I, I you know. know the name. <laughs> All right. And now this next one. What happens? This is kind of relevant to today. What happens when a pitcher allows no hits or walks in a game? Is it a no-hitter, a perfect game, or a fantastic performance? All of the above. It's a perfect game. Close enough. We have more <laughs> questions for you in between the next break. But for, <laughs> for now, and the rest of them are all baseball-related. We welcome Danny Gill to the plate. I did not warn Grace I would be doing this before the game, and I did tell everybody else on our team up here that I was going to do this to Grace I for mean, some mild entertainment. Yeah, it's, it's perfect. <laughs> Didn't do too bad so No, far. not so, so far. far. So far. You only got one wrong so far. Exactly. There's 11 total. I think we got to five. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> It's all about learning today. As that one swung on a miss by Gill, the count moves to one and one. Gill, another hitter who's been struggling as of late for post, but looking to try and right the ship early on in the year. That one's low for a ball. Count moves to two and one. Pitch from Brat in there, swung on a miss by Gill. Count moves to two and two. Brat taking his time here as he has most of the first few innings. Kind of picked it up towards the second as that one's outside for a ball. Count moves to three and two. That one's low, going to go to the backstop, and that'll be just a walk, but the runner can still go if he wants. He will not. That was Peluso behind the plate catching, and Grace knows a thing or two about catching. I, I, this is how I'm going to segue stuff to make Grace talk at times. Grace is familiar with catching because she was the starting goalie for women's ice hockey for the last couple of years. And I asked her the other day, but we're going to put her on air to say it too, which do you think is harder, stopping a puck or stopping a baseball like we just saw Christian Peluso try to do behind the plate? Um, I definitely think stopping a puck is harder. I do 
recognize like it being hard on the lower body for both catchers and goalies hard on the knees especially but i think stopping a puck is a lot harder <laughs> might might be worth more too i mean we did float the idea of having athletes do different sports maybe we should have matt seaman your favorite player throw you a pitch from behind the plate while you're in full catcher's gear and we can see <laughs> You know, we'll get you in the catcher spirit and see how, what it's like doing it from both ends of it as that pitch is outside to Pavelchak. Oh, I'll definitely do that. It's just like getting a hockey puck from maybe a guy or like my brother who probably <laughs> shoots close to 90 plus miles an hour when he really wants to. 1-1. <laughs> one, one. They go for the pickoff move at first and he slides back in safely. Him being Gil. Still 0-0 zero, zero here on the bottom of the third. It's high for a ball, two and one. And we talk about breaking records, too, today. <laughs> I already saw your head go down when I said that. You broke a record or two or six during your career yeah. over the last several years, oh, both yeah. career-wise and season-wise. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's nice to at least what I have all, all, what I've always said is just, like, leave the program better than how I found it, so... It's nice to know that I am leaving it in good hands with Saunders coming up, who broke some records as well, but she's got two more years coming up, so that'll be good. Yeah, she's coming for all your records now oh, as yeah. Gil slides <laughs> oh, yeah. in safely. The women's ice hockey team got their first playoff win in the history of the program after seven years against St. A's in game two of the three-game series before falling in game four, three. Excuse me, that was a strike swinging. <laughs> the count moves to three and two. And you and Saunders before the third period of game three, it was, I, I still don't know how I remember this, it was 139 saves and 143 shot attempts. Oh, yeah. It's not, not necessarily normal for goalies to see that many shots within what eight periods up to that point yeah so yeah it's definitely not normal but we made it happen brant delivers the three two low for a ball he walks gill was running in case of a hit and run so uh it'll be first and second now with no one out are you familiar with what a hit and run is i'm guessing it's when they hit the ball and then someone can run well, usually the runner will start before the pitch is thrown, as the pitch is being thrown. Oh, okay. And they'll try and swing away at it. Okay. At the same time. Okay. Is there any baseball lingo that you're not familiar with that you've heard before? Uh, <laughs> I Before, I think last weekend, I wasn't familiar with an error, but I know what that is now, kind of. It's like if they kind of hit the ball or they touch the ball trying to catch it and it falls or something like that and that's an error on them I'm, from what <laughs> i was explained to that's what it seemed like we can call him out you were talking to dario sosa about the <laughs> about the sport we're on a baseball yeah. broadcast grace takes a lot of pictures for us almost too many at times <laughs> and she was down there taking photos talking to dario sosa about baseball last week sosa the freshman local freshman who started a few games earlier this year for post to try and learn the ins and outs of baseball. But you're not the only one. I mean, she's not here right now. She's downstairs. But you're not the only one who doesn't know a lot about baseball. We have Bianca, who also doesn't know too, too much. So we've been teaching her as well. She told us when she was here last week, after this 0-1, Cornwell tried the sacrifice there and goes outside 1-1. She told us coming to the game last Friday was the first time she'd ever seen a baseball game in her entire life. Of course, it's not a huge sport over in New Zealand, but here it's, I mean, it's called America's pastime, but I i feel like it's still not number one in America overall. So that one's bunted foul. I think soccer's overtaken it, and then, like, I think football is also up there, and then, like, hockey and basketball or like three four after that something like that 
in terms of fastest growing sports and then baseball. Yeah, I, I haven't seen too many baseball games in my life. Just in my hometown, Delano, Minnesota, we have the largest uh, 4th of July celebration. So there's a big, in the state of Minnesota, uh, there's a big baseball tournament that happens, and I sometimes would watch some of that. That one was chopped back to Brent on the mound, and then he's able to tag Cornwell out. It almost works like a sacrifice. Runners go over to second and third with one out now. And that'll bring up Chris Corchado. Big chance here to get some runs after they had a chance with DJ Karen on third last inning with only one out. And they'll try and do it again with Corchado at the dish. So you never got to go to like a Twins game? I did, I think, one time. Never really went again after that because <laughs> I got pulled over for the first time on my way there. So <laughs> <laughs> not, not a good core memory <laughs> to say the least. Might have been going a little too fast to get there. <laughs> You're that excited for baseball. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I think last spring I went to a Yankees game. I still didn't necessarily like it. The pitch clock. I think I'd rather, like, have it slowed down in the pros so then you actually get your money's worth. But <laughs> that's just me. There's been a debate about that since oh, they yeah, added yeah. it. And it will be coming to the college level pretty soon as well, it seems like. That one's low for a ball. Count moves to 1-1 one one on Corchado. I was going to say, if you've been here for four years, you better have been able to get to at least a Yankees game or a Red Sox game. Yeah. Oh, I did actually go to a Red Sox game <laughs> in the fall with my brother. <laughs> we wanted to just go to Boston for the day, and the Red Sox were playing, so we said might as well. It kind of got rain delayed, but it was a fun time. A fun the, time. So you got your money's worth despite the pitch clock oh, yeah, is what yeah, I'm yeah. hearing. Yeah, I had to get the little uh, <laughs> ice cream in the baseball In the hat, helmet, yep. And then got the popcorn in the helmet too, so we have those in our kitchen. I have a whole stack of those from when I was younger. <laughs> Yeah, I remember. Strike three on the outside corner of Corchado, so that's two away, and that will bring up the cleanup hitter. And Jimmy Brennan looking to do some damage. He had that big doubleheader last week and had a single in game one, but see what he can do as now I don't know. Are they pulling the pitcher here? Okay. Yeah, they're pulling the pitcher here. So they're going to go to the bullpen, kind of like a goalie change. They're going to bring in someone new after 54 pitches. So it looks like it was mostly a bullpen day for... Well, this is perfect. We can do more questions for you. Anyways, <laughs> once we figure out who's on the mound, I want to make sure we know oh, yeah. <laughs> who's on the mound first. <laughs> do any of your Canadian teammates know who the Montreal Expos are? I don't know. You should ask them. That, that might be a good question of the day. You have baseball crossover <laughs> with hockey. That's number 17 on the mound, Colby Seelig. All right, Jack, fire up the next question. What do we got? Oh, this one's perfect. What is it called when a player batter reaches base on a fielding mistake, an out, a hit, or an error? An error. Perfect. See, we were just talking about that. That yeah. was a perfect segue perfect in. Perfect timing. When a pitcher, oh, what did I write? <laughs> when a pitcher throws to first with a runner on base, what is it called? Is it called tag, you're it, a delay of game, or a pickoff play slash move? Pickoff play. Yeah, yep, you got it. Because I overheard you saying it. <laughs> I'm very observant. That's the thing. I was hoping, too, when asking these, you'd pick up on it as we went. A batter hits a home run with the bases loaded. Is it called a home run, game over, or a grand slam. I'd like it to be game over, but it's a grand <laughs> slam. Don't jinx it because now <laughs> someone's going to do it. And <laughs> if it's not for us, you're going to have some unhappy post fans at home. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> what is an ERA for a pitcher? Is it every run averaged, an earned runs accounted, or earned run average? Uh, earned runs average. You are correct. It's kind of like goals against average. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I was going. Like I was thinking like the counted, but I was like, mm. that's why I did that similar. Well, we got like two more, I think, still. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll do those in between these, <laughs> the third and fourth innings. I even put your like 
one of your photos in there too. There's a photo of you on the screen for everybody to see. You'll have to <laughs> see have it to next half in. inning. Oh god. That's a ball. <laughs> Up high, I want it on the count. Low 2-0 the count to Brennan. Again, that's Colby Selig on the mound. His earned run average, as we just learned with Grace, is a 5.40 5, 5 ERA. 0-0, zero zero, 8 appearances all from the bullpen. 1 save, 18 and one thirds innings, 17 hits, 14 runs, 11 earned at pitches outside for ball 3. 6 walks on the verge of potentially a 7th. And then 27 strikeouts along with three doubles and two home runs. And batters are hitting 246 against him. So with a ERA, is I'm guessing five might be a little high, or is that kind of low? That's high. Okay. Well, I, you know, it's kind of hard to tell because that one's in their first strike. Because with baseball and the metal bats, there is a lot more offense now. Whereas, like, if you saw a 5.40 5 goals against <laughs> average... Yeah, we know that's not good no matter what. (laughs) No. And when you're factoring this in, it factors in sort of like with you guys with saves. It factors in, as Brennan swings and fouls that one off, it factors in um, innings pitched, and then it's like divided by – I don't even know the (laughs) entire – like. Don't know the math behind it. That's what Google's for, and that's why (laughs) if I wanted to know, I would just Google ERA calculator, kind (laughs) of like I did save percentage calculator at one point this year to get – stats for you guys that's gonna be low for ball four and the bases are loaded and here we go if if dj karen hits a grand slam right now <laughs> it would be pretty poetic and considering how everything's played out when we've uh been having these conversations <laughs> so far might, but it might just be like saying the word shut out and then <laughs> you know someone gets scored on well that's why i didn't say no hitter <laughs> until the seventh inning because i refused to jinx it but i alluded to it several times. Oh, okay, okay. But yeah, if DJ Karen were to hit a home run here, it would not be game over. <laughs> it would be a even grand slam. Even would though be. even <laughs> though Grace wishes it would be. We have four innings minimum still to play, depending on the score. That pitch was outside from Seelig and now a mound visit from the catcher Peluso to talk things over. Both teams with rosters over 40. Seems like a lot of people. A lot of it is pitching because you, the overarm motion is not natural in baseball, so they can't do what softball does in pitch. I mean, they could if they wanted to, but <laughs> it would probably be very painful. Pitch as long and as effective as the softball players can with a natural underarm motion. Fair enough. He's in there for a strike to Karen, one and one. Seelig trying to work out of a bases loaded jam now against Karen, who led off last inning with a double. So the Eagles have batted around in the last couple of innings, but it still says zero on the scoreboard so far. He's low in the dirt, two and one the count. And be sure to stick around after the game, too. We're going to try and get Matt Seaman up here to discuss his no-hitter. And if Post wins game two, get somebody else from game two up here uh, to talk with them. Grace, you want to conduct that interview? I definitely can if I have the questions in front of me. (laughs) Oh, we don't have questions. We come up with them on the fly. Exactly. (laughs) I'll need the questions written down. That one's outside for ball three. And now Karen on the verge of potentially being walked which would give the Eagles a one nothing lead. You can probably hear Bianca to my left. <laughs> you know, we do have a microphone. As that's grounded on the ground <laughs> to the right Here side. Karen's going to score. Let's get an RBI single. Two runs are going to score. Yay. And the Eagles lead 2 to nothing now. And runners on the corners. So they finally get the big breakthrough hit with DJ Karen. He's two for two, and he's halfway to the cycle. Grace, do you know what the cycle is for uh, baseball? No. Single, double, triple, and a home run all in the same game. Okay. So he's already got the easiest parts of it, per se. 
The last two are the triple and the home run, which are the toughest. <laughs> makes sense, makes sense. I was saying, we have a microphone, too, in that box, and we could literally hook it up and have <laughs> Bianca, join. Bianca join in on this. <laughs> She's eating her smart food right now. That pitch is low and in the dirt to Rivera, counts 1-0. Rivera looking to add on to this Eagles lead as Bowman shaded up the middle in the shift. Ooh. Inside nearly hits Rivera. 2-0 the count. See, that's what just does not seem fun is almost getting hit. I was very fortunate in the two years that I played <laughs> Little League. I, which, I mean, I feel like you're more susceptible to being hit in Little League, honestly. True, See, but like, it's different. not as hard. See, like, the delivers, and that goes foul, so they'll do it again, two and one. This is true, too, but we had some people, even at age 11 or 12, who it looked like they were throwing pretty hard. <laughs> See, I did a uh, little, little t-ball. I, I was one of the kids that was out in the field picking at the grass, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> you were just getting ready to do the crouch position for when you became a goalie oh, eventually. Yeah. That's what yeah, it was. exactly. <laughs> Go with the pickoff move at first, nothing doing. Yeah, in two years, when I, I did both pitch, obviously hitting, but <laughs> I was a pitcher. Never got hit with, like, a comebacker, which is always scary, but never got hit with the ball ever, somehow. Only when I would, like, be playing with friends in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Took one off the face. Chopper by Rivera. Bowman was shaded over, slides, grabs it, throws the first, and he's retired. So the Eagles get two runs. Excuse me, that was Bobby Sabatino out there in the field at second base. Not Bowman. Bowman had started, it said, but Sabatino retires, and that'll do it here for the bottom of the third. The Eagles get two runs. And speaking of two, we've got two, two more questions, questions for Grace. This has really all flowed well this inning in terms of uh, what we're doing. All right. Grace, what would an out be? Would it be... These are the three different options. So is it when a fielder tags the base and throws or throws to it or catches the ball in the air? That's option one. Option two, the fielder hits the runner with the ball, tags them with the ball, or steps on the base. Or three, he feels the ball on the ground, in the air, or on one foot. Definitely the first option. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> All right, and now the last question. I think you've gotten like eight out of the 11 or 10 <laughs> correct. So we're, we're doing good. What is a passed ball? Is it when a pitcher throws the ball by the catcher? Is it when the ball gets by the catcher after the pitcher throws it? Or similar to hockey, is it when one run gets in for the team batting? Would it be the second option when... I don't remember what it was. Yeah, no, you're correct. Okay, it is. Okay. All right. <laughs> I had to think about that one. Yeah, so Grace, you pretty much passed. So I can play baseball now. You could play baseball I now. I can play baseball. We're going to talk to Coach Scold after the game <laughs> and see if we can get you. You'd probably be the first female in the CAC, CACC <laughs> and in post-history to play on the baseball team, I would have to assume. Someone's got to do it. <laughs> Just break another record. Breaking barriers. <laughs> Brennan Holligan is warming up here in the top of the fourth. He's got a two-run lead now. Some would say, in hockey at least, two-goal lead is the most dangerous lead. So you think you got it. It could be swept right underneath you. So basically you just got to get it to three and you're good? Yeah, less stress. Because <laughs> all it takes is one, you know? Like in a two... Two run lead, it, all it takes is one, and then they're literally right back in it unless we get more, you know? This is true. Yeah. Justin Geiger stepping up. I'll try and figure out the defensive alignment, too, because it looked like there was a different player out there for you – know, what. Post's field is the same. It seems like Chestnut Hill had a couple changes that the umpire didn't signal up. We saw the pitching change. We saw the catcher change after the first inning. 
But I noticed that wasn't Bowman at second last half inning. Phoenix Bowman. It was Bobby Sabatino. So that one swung on a miss. One and two the count. So it's just a matter of figuring out when exactly he subbed in. It, I'm going to guess it was at the top of the last inning. Because he was in the field defensively. I thought that pitch was right down the middle for a strike. But home plate umpire thought it was a little bit out of the zone. And we'll go to a 2-2 count. Looks like a good catch to me. And that one's hitting the right field. Pavel Chat going over, grabs it, one away. Well, you did just say you could do umpiring or... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basically. I know the rules. <laughs> a little. Well, we just taught you a bunch of them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, actually, we taught you stats more than anything, <laughs> which is what you wanted to learn. So we, we, we've taught stats, and we'll teach more over the next... Four innings. There's not going to be any more surprises that I'm aware of unless Jack <laughs> Jack comes up with something random that I don't know about. <laughs> or Bianca. That one's hit over towards where my car was parked earlier for strike number one. It's hit over towards the softball game going on over there right now. This is true. There is a few different games going on over there. Yeah. Oh, one. Swung on and missed. Count moves to 0 and 2. Post 3 and 1 so far in conference play, looking to make it 4 and 1, and they're in the driver's seat right now to do it up to nothing. But obviously, need to hold this lead for the next four innings and possibly get more because, as Grace said, the most dangerous lead is a two goal, or well, in this case, run lead which is all Post is leading by right now. Swung on and missed. Two away as Crane goes down swinging. That'll bring Huth to the plate, who's 0-for-0 zero zero with a walk in this game. How do you think you would do in the batter's box? Uh, Probably not that good. <laughs> I know I have hand-eye coordination down somewhat, but I don't know. It's easier when it's coming at you and you got to stop it versus trying to transfer that energy. And swing it. Yeah, <laughs> and swing it and get it to somewhere where it won't get caught. 1-0 in there for a strike, 1-1. One and one. What about any of the skaters on your team? Do you think they would be able to make contact? Because I see, like, Casey sometimes would knock down, <laughs> you know, high pucks at the middle of the ice that are flying at her. Oh, yeah. I definitely – I think Julia might be good at it. Um, maybe Tristan. I don't know really about anybody else. I think they'd be <laughs> kind of too scared of the ball coming at them. <laughs> well, if any of your teammates are listening as that one's fouled off to the right – that's a challenge. Yeah. One two count from Holligan. That one's just outside for a ball. Count moves to two and two. Two two count, no one on Holligan. Trying to get out of this inning without giving up a run. The Eagles, that would be 11 straight innings without giving up a run. And it looks like it will be as that one's popped into the outfield. Coming over to get it is Gill, side retired. So the Eagles will head into the bottom of the fourth with a 2-0 lead. We'll take a quick break here because we're out of <laughs> questions for now. Here on the CACC Network.
Bottom four here from Municipal Stadium. I keep wanting to say Lemoy. I'm so used to being <laughs> over at Lemoy for softball and all our events. It's been a while since we've been at Municipal until the other week when we got here. And Jalen Kelly leading things off here in the for uh, the fourth swings and misses at the first pitch from Seelig. So setting the field right now, I'm looking around. It is still, in fact, Geiger at third. I, that actually now now that that is still I the 45 and 15 are confusing me. I'm pretty sure that is still Levan at short. But that is Bobby Sabatino. He must have come in last inning over there. John Crane is at first. That is still McCall in left field. Can't get a read on the center or right, but they don't look like they've changed either. So it looks like it was just some infield switches with Phoenix Bowman coming out and then the catcher change we saw earlier as that one's chopped over to short. Levan came into charge that should go down as an error because of the way he tried to pick it kind of like what we were talking about earlier grace with the way you feel that kind of makes a difference oh yeah but if it's hit wicked hard too in some cases it does go down as a single but that'll be an error Hunter Keller coming to the plate. Joshua Chen pinch running at first. I believe that's the first time we've seen him get into a home game. Not 100% sure. Grace, do you remember taking photos of him? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly... It's a good possibility. The number looks familiar. Number 43. And familiar. Chen does his job to get over to second on Keller's sack bunt. So now there's a runner on second. That would be a big insurance run to get it to 3 nothing. And that would bring uh, that brings up Danny Gill with one out here. Well, Bianca is out there now, so maybe she's getting some photos of Josh on second. I don't know where <laughs> she is. I can't see her from up here. Selig delivers. Swung on a miss by Gill. 0-1. Top of the order coming up and Michael Pavelchak. He's 1-for-1 one one today. Unless something crazy were to happen with a double play here, that would be the case. There's two hits so far for Chestnut Hill, three for post, and one error for Chestnut Hill as that one's swung on a miss by Gill. Starting nine has pretty much stayed the same for post, game in and game out, and then when you go to your pitcher, it's obviously changing from game to game, as we talked about, and the same pitcher's not throwing every single day. He usually will get three, four, or five days off. That's why Joe Christiana's not starting game two. So Brennan Holligan usually would come out of the pen. But Holligan has started in certain spots this year. This is his second start this year. And typically you'll see that if you have your number two who can't pitch and Cristiano went over just around 100 pitches in game two against Felician on Friday. So there was no way he was going to be able to go only three days later. That one's chopped over to first. Stepping on the bag and retiring. Stepping on the bag and retiring is Crane. Going over to third is Chen, the pinch runner. So we'll also have to look out two. No, I'm sorry. That was in the DH spot. So Kelly's out of the game. Chen will now be the new DH for the time being. The designated hitter in the lineup. And Michael Pavelchak will have a chance to score Chen from third. Seems like as it's gotten later in the day, it's getting a little bit colder. In here in the press box, too. That one's hitting a right field by Pavel Chak, but right over there to get it is McCall. Side retired. So at the end of four, Post still leading 2 nothing. Had a runner on third, and Josh Chen not able to do anything with it. We'll be back shortly here on the CHCC Network.
As we head to the top of the fifth, Holligan's still on the mound, so he'll get the win if he gets out of this inning with the score still 2-0. And we're taking a look at the only other game in action round post. It's the women's lacrosse team who currently leads 5-1 after one. CACC Rookie of the Week, Roxana Dabitska, hoping I said that right, <laughs> has three goals. She's got a hat trick in the first. Her former, well, her former, her current teammate who she played with in Poland as well, Clara Domkowska, also has a goal and an assist. Gabrielle Fiora has got a goal, and then Hilda McHenry also has an assist. So, Eagles... Bouncing back so far from that early season loss or that, that loss the other day against Holy Family. They're second on the conference slate that they've lost, and they're one and two right now. But speaking of Poland, Grace, you were telling us about your trip to Poland. What was that like for you going over to Poland uh recently? Um, it wasn't necessarily recently. I went there uh I think my senior year of high school, right before it started. It wasn't bad. Uh, did some of the touristy things. It's a it's a beautiful place. I I will say I like their McDonald's there. <laughs> Chopped over to short. Cornwell over to first. Gets Corchado one away. Yeah, and it was an innovative uh, <laughs> breakfast burrito I got at the McDonald's. They put the hash brown inside the breakfast burrito. Interesting, interesting. It was good. It was good. I took a picture of it and everything. I took a picture <laughs> of the inside. It was so good. I wish I got, like, four of them. <laughs> did it make it on the gram back then, though? Uh, That's the big thing. It did not it make didn't? it on the gram, no. <laughs> Holligan fires. It's high for a ball. I want to know the count. For my first trip to Europe, that was when I went to Poland. No food made it on the gram, but this past trip I was going to say, you were just in London. Yep. <laughs> That's my third trip to Europe. <laughs> uh, my second trip this past summer, oh, one whole, like, slide of my Instagram post was all the food I ate, and then even when I was in London for spring break, my food made it on the gram. <laughs> that one's through the left side. And getting on base with a hit of Sabatino, who... Came in the other inning for Phoenix Bowman. And Chestnut Hill's got the technical, technically the tying run at the plate now with nobody out. Post lacrosse just took a 6 1 lead now. Haley McHenry with the goal and Sam Targonski with an assist there. Holligan looking to pick off at first. Nothing doing. What was your favorite part of the trip to London? Um, I think hmm, I might have to say like Stonehenge, going to see that because uh, I'd been to London before, didn't go outside of the city much, but we went to Stonehenge and maybe just like being over there with my brother and my dad and my mom because we don't really take many family trips together. So I'm just glad my dad got over there. I mean, long haul from Arizona to London, but. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you told me he took a red eye yeah. right after getting back. Yeah. He, back uh, to Arizona. Yeah, we had a, I think it was like 2 o'clock in London, got back to the States around 6 p.m., and then he was on another flight from at 11 p.m. to go back to Arizona straight through. I mean, that, that must have been brutal. Seven and a half hour flight and a five hour flight. <laughs> back to back. Yeah. And changing three different time zones as oh, yeah. <laughs> Holligan has three different strikes right there to get the second out of the inning in McCall. And that will send Ciotti the plate who's 0 for 1 with two outs here. And still that runner on first. Eagles leading 2 nothing. So if he came back on Friday... Jack, did he make? He would he have made it in time for your grandmother's wedding <laughs> down in Arizona? <laughs> As they're gonna pick off, it looks like yeah, Brennan's gonna get the out at first. Sabatino was far too far off the base. Looked like he was getting ready to attempt to steal, but then didn't. Brennan then is able to gun him down over there. I couldn't see it around the 
the brick wall in front of me, but I was able to <laughs> peek my head out and see that Sabatino gets thrown out over there, and the sides are tired. So the Eagles six outs away from getting out of here with a doubleheader sweep. They head to the bottom of the fifth, though, in a 2 nothing game. And as we say that, too, yes, as I was mentioning before that play just happened, congratulations to Jack Olson, our grad assistant's <laughs> grandmother, getting married over the spring break. <laughs> I just thought it was funny that Grace, your father, was happened to be going back there right when it's a small world. our very own. Yeah, that's what you said. You said that's a Minnesota thing that they say. Yeah, it, <laughs> I, I think it's a Minnesotan thing to say when it's a small world. Like my first time coming out to Post, my parents were driving back and they had to drop off uh, the toll pass in Illinois and just so happened to see uh, parents of a girl I played hockey with from my high school who just got done dropping their kid off at uh, Army West Point. So, I mean, live in the same town, but then see each other for the first time in a few years in <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> what are some things that are particular about Minnesota that you've noticed don't really exist on the East Coast in Connecticut? I see Jack turning around, too, because he's also from Minnesota. <laughs> Culver's. Culver's, Culver's, Culver's. The best little burger joint. I mean, if you need a greasy burger, some crinkle-cut fries, some custard. They got flavors of the day. <laughs> so good. Uh, I know a lot of people, like my teammate Macy, she loves caribou coffee. Um, I'm not a big coffee drinker. Never really got into going to caribou, either for like their non-coffee drinks, but... Caribou with coffee is a big one. Uh, I don't know. Maybe the lakes. I mean, and kind of the coldness. All three years here, there hasn't been ice to go play pond hockey on. So kind of kind of sucks for that. But I don't know. What else is there? <laughs> well, yeah. Mall of America. I know Macy was asked by someone out here, he was like, is the mall actually like that worth it? And she was so confused because she thought that they were asking about Brass Mill Center. <laughs> <laughs> and then she realized it was the Mall of America, and she's like, nah, not really. Did you know Macy at all before, like, ever cross paths um, with her being both from Minnesota? No, she's from northern Minnesota, uh, about two and a half hours from the cities where I was 45 minutes from the cities. We never played each other, never played with each other because it was always like split up by sections. And then she actually only lives about an hour from my cabin. So we're probably going to meet up a bunch of this summer and <laughs> hang out on the lake. <laughs> That's a ball outside. Want to know Marlon Rose now on the mound, the senior who pitched yesterday, actually Rose so far this year. Trying to find his stats here in the pack. It's in their first strike to Evan Cornwell. Rose, the top pitch on the team, 2.70 ERA, 2-4 and four record, 11 appearances, 1 save, 23 in the third innings, 17 hits, 14 runs, 7 earned, 8 walks, 18 strikeouts. That one's in their first strike. You, Grace, you're like shaking your head like a bobblehead when I was reading all I'm those like, numbers. That's, that's a lot of stats right there. <laughs> a lot to keep track of. I only got starts, minutes. Uh, goals against average, goals against saves. Not all save those. percentage. Yeah, save percentage. <laughs> Cornwall grounds that the second. Thrown over by Sabatino to first. One retired here in the fifth inning. What's the go-to spot for your Canadian teammates? Is it is it Bob Evans? Because I've heard Bob Evans is pretty popular up there. Or is that New Tim York? Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons. Tim that's what Hortons. I, Bob Bob Evans is another restaurant joint, but that's in like Pennsylvania. Oh, never <laughs> heard of it. No, Canadians love their Tim Hortons. I don't blame them. I've had it a bit. Uh, their Tim Bits, yeah. They got apparently some good coffee. Like I said, not a big coffee drinker. Uh, I know sometimes when Canadian families come down, they'll bring like boxes of Tim Bits for the girls, and then. Uh, their chicken Caesar wrap, uh, so good, so good. Either cold or warm. So the hype is legitimate. I think I think <laughs> the hype is legitimate, especially if they have nothing else. Like they don't got caribou up there, so they got Timmy's. Falls outside to Corchado with one away here, a two and one the count from Rose. Got 
Crochado swinging at that one foul. Oh, jeez. I don't know if that hit one of the players out there. If it did, it might have, like, lightly grazed them. But everybody was jumping out of the way. Brendan Holligan is down there, too. And he He's probably still going to pitch next inning. So he just fled into the dugout, too. But looks like no one was hurt down there as that pitch is low. And 3-2 and two the count to Corchado. I was taking pictures over there. I probably would have been hit. You, yeah, yeah. Honestly, you probably would have. <laughs> I would have been zoned out. <laughs> Especially if you're looking through the lens at yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to get the photo of it coming towards <laughs> you. <laughs> you pretty much would have. That one's chopped back to Rose. Corchado is out at first. Retired 1-3, and there's two away here in the fifth. The baseball players have a lot of superstitions as – Jimmy Brennan comes to the plate. What's your pregame superstition that you would normally do before a game? Um, well, it's like a three-hour process. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sharpen my skates, tape my stick, pretty normal on that. I'm the only one that touches my skates ever. It's fouled off to the right. So you don't tape it any specific way. I know some people are even superstitious about the direction they tape it in. Um, I tape the heel to toe, but then I cross back three times. I've done it since junior year of high school. Very weird. People don't understand. I don't know why I do it. <laughs> it doesn't look bad in my opinion. Um, and then I listen to the same playlist while I do my ball routine, get the hands warmed up, the eyes warmed up. And then in the locker room, I listened to a different playlist that I've had since I was a junior in high school. So <laughs> It's fouled off by Brennan, and count remains 0-2. So nothing like putting the left sock on before the right sock or <laughs> oh, definitely. anything crazy. Uh, for me, <laughs> it is right, or it's left skate on, right skate on, left skate tied, right skate tied. And then it's right pad tied, left pad tied, right pad on, left pad on. That's, I think, the only, like, superstitious part. I've always done it like that. It's very weird. Uh, <laughs> and then on the ice, I, when I go around to shoot. Oh. Brennan's going to carry that one into right field. McCall makes the catch, and that retires the side. After five, <laughs> it's 2 nothing post. We head to the sixth. Hollyan probably coming back out. I don't see. Oh. Well, our PA announcer, John Wood, didn't realize that the inning is over. The inning is, in <laughs> fact, over. He was announcing DJ Karen at the dish. But no, I almost thought we weren't paying attention. But no, we were locked in. We were locked in. Hollyan's going to come out for the uh, sixth inning. And, Grace, you're going to finish your story now. Oh. Um. <laughs> So usually, like, with being captain this year at the captain's meeting, I'd always be first to the meeting. Uh, I was the same way in high school when I was a captain. I always just stood there and waited and knew when I had to go over to the refs. But then when we're going around shooting in a circle, I have to go two from one side and one from the other side. Just how it is. I skate from the boards and stick handle and turn the same way. Always have to be the last one off the ice, too. <laughs> It's it's a, it's everything. It's a process. Oh yeah, people didn't understand it until then. They realized, oh yeah, she needs to do it. <laughs> How close during your career at Post did you ever come to scoring a goal? Did you ever come close to scoring like an empty netter or anything? No. 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 <laughs> uh, the past two years, I haven't necessarily been allowed to play the puck. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Even if we had the opportunity, we. Uh, wouldn't really have been able to, but also the two times this year that we had that opportunity, or I guess maybe three. I don't remember if St. Mike's pulled their goalie when we played them or not, but uh, there was so much pressure on me. There's, I was definitely not thinking about that. I was just thinking oh, yeah. about beating Stonehill and Sacred Heart. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, you're yeah. probably not focused <laughs> on trying to score, especially no, with Sacred no. Heart pummeling you in that one game <laughs> yeah. in December. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But I will say, when Allmark scored last year, that was a pretty goal. I was so happy as a Bruins fan. I was happy as a Flyers fan <laughs> this past weekend when Philly finally got uh, a win against them. Uh, <laughs> I was not happy. I'm pretty sure Swayman was in net for that. So we're in the top of the six now. Up of the dish is Ciotti after the pickoff play last half inning. Or excuse me, in the top of the fifth inning. It's 2 nothing Eagles. 
can hear the softball game going on over here. Yeah, that's not post-softball. We don't know what softball game that is on the nearby field here at Municipal, but something big just happened, and something big just went into the air here. It's the baseball in the center field. Danny Gill makes the catch, and there's one retired here in the sixth. Holligan has looked pretty impressive. If anything, right now, we're probably interviewing two pitchers after this game. <laughs> Because the offense really hasn't done too, too much. And I think we're getting a pinch hitter here because I see Coach Spat over talking to, excuse me, Spratt over with them. Yeah, Andrew Saworski, who started in game one, is going to Step in for the pinch hit here. Try and see if they can get something going. Swung on and missed. Owen won the count. Holligan fires low. Ball one. Count moves to one and one. Do you have any family members that are listening back home? Or know that you're doing this? Um, no, I sent a picture of me to my parents. <laughs> and uh, Swarovski I'm... lifts that into center field. <laughs> Gill's going to range over two away. That'll bring up Myers. And I, uh, I said, guess what I'm doing? And my mom, I'm guessing, just read it wrong. And she said, nothing. What about you? Dad is driving and not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so they are not <laughs> listening. Not yet. Yeah, not yet. Probably won't be because I don't think my mom can figure out how to get to a live stream on her phone. Oh. <laughs> well, how does she watch your games when she's not there? Computer. Oh. Yeah. Well. Oh well, this yeah, is, yeah, that's yeah, right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. You can get it. Through. You can get it. You can watch all of Post Eagle events on your <laughs> mobile devices or your laptops. Anywhere. That your you pagers, can if you still yeah. have a pager, you might be able to. I don't know. Oh, it's high for a ball, and so Holligan, Holligan behind in the count. 2 and 0. What about any of your teammates? I honestly don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they're in class. So probably not. They wouldn't have the volume on watching in class. 3 0 count. Post highlights on the post underscore W I H Instagram page. <laughs> That's post women's ice hockey's <laughs> Instagram run by Grace. That one's outside for a ball, and that's going to be a walk issue to Myers, which will bring up Geiger, who is the tying run here in the top of the six. There's still there's not plenty of game left. There's four outs to work with if you're Chestnut Hill, but like there's still a lot of opportunity because this is only a two-run game for them to get back into it. and They have the part of the lineup they'd want up. Their two, three, four hitters are up which are usually your big bats in the lineup. Pitch is in there for a strike. When you went to the Twins game, was it before or after they went outdoors? It was after, so it was at Twin or The target, target field. field. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Holligan's going to get that one on the mound. Flip over to first, side retired post, still up 2 nothing after five and a half. They're three outs away from getting the doubleheader sweep. But first, they'll come to bat here in the bottom of the sixth. We'll be right back after a short break here on the CACC Network.
All right, now DJ Karen's at the dish. Marlon Rose still pitching. Eagles probably want to get another run or two here to try and just pad this two-run lead. Holligan's looked really good. So I can't imagine he'd be coming out in the seventh. And right before the break, we were talking about if Grace went to Target Field, and she just showed us pictures from the Winter Classic two years ago. Oh, yeah. At Target Field. Yeah. As we're waiting for the catcher to fix his gear. And you were saying it was the coldest game on record? I believe so. It was coldest game because of the negative wind chill. So I think it was like negative 20, and then you add the wind chill, it was probably around like negative 40. Felt like negative 60. But what's the coldest you've experienced being out in Minnesota, or in general, if it's been here? Because I know we've had some <laughs> very cold. It's definitely not been cold here. It <laughs> definitely has not been cold here. I don't think I really used a winter jacket this year. Oh, well, not this year. Yeah, but even past years hasn't really been cold. Um, I remember when I was in like fourth grade, we had school canceled for like three days of the week because it was too cold for kids to stand out at the bus stop. So the governor, the governor canceled school for the whole state. So they kind of set a precedent for that year <laughs> at least. It was a nice week. Fouled back, but you also have to make those days up at the end of Not the if the year. governor. Oh no, really? Yeah. I didn't know that was a rule. Yeah. It was pretty nice, but also when I was younger, I went to a private school until or up until seventh grade. Karen's down looking, one away. Rose gets him for the first out of the inning. That'll bring Justin Rivera to the plate, who's 0 and 2. But yeah, at a private school in Minnesota, if you have days off, you don't gotta make them up. That's right. Private's yeah. different from public. So I always forget nice. that. There was one year. We did have to go to school a week early because there was some type of conference going on middle of March, but we got two weeks of spring break. That was the best <laughs> year ever. When it was ever that cold, did you ever try and do the thing where you take the hot water and yes. go outside and throw it? Did it work, and did you accidentally get splashed with any of that? It did work. <laughs> like my mom, I showed my mom once, and we did it one time, and it worked. Usually... <laughs> Line drive by Rivera into right field. That's a single. So Rivera on with his first hit of the game. And that'll bring up. Well, we'll see, actually, because Josh Chen was in that spot. And. It's going to be Dario Sosa. Your baseball buddy's coming up to bat. <laughs> yeah, with a little hood sticking out of the back of his jersey. <laughs> Listen, I'm not going to knock it because you know me going yeah. down to the rink. Every time in between intermissions, I'd be walking around with a ski mask on. and Well, not a ski mask, but pretty much a ski mask. Yeah. And multiple layers on because I was cold. And Grace is there in her warm pads after playing 20 <laughs> minutes on the ice telling me it's not cold in there it's not that cold <laughs> it's not cold enough because there's no wind so you don't need the ski mask well it gets cold up where we are <laughs> <laughs> which is outside for a ball to sosa i believe this is sosa's first at bat at municipal too so far this year i'm pretty sure he actually hit at the end of the game last week i might have completely phased that out at that point depending I on which game it was pictures that's why i know <laughs> <laughs> Checking the season stats. Oh, no, it was actually the end of the Southern New Hampshire. Oh, no, he didn't. Uh, did he get it? Yeah. yeah, I thought it said run. Okay, yeah, he did bat at the Southern New Hampshire game, so I didn't remember that one. <laughs> that well. one's fouled off, and Count moves to two and one. So this is his second ever at bat at Municipal. There's, like you said, 40-man roster. Like Yeah, you lose track of it. Yeah. Right? Whereas you guys were only, like, 25, I think? Not even. We had... Uh... 22 by the end of the year, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so I knew you guys, yeah. but pretty <laughs> really quick. It was at our 21, so it was pretty easy to know. Chopper, that's going to be a tough play by Geiger. Sosa's going to hustle, but he's going to be out. Wow, that was a tight, tight play there at first. Do you agree as the resident umpire of the press box? <laughs> um... <laughs> Sure. <laughs> I'm just going to concur with Mike Williams out there in the field. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, it's a tough call, so. <laughs> Puss lacrosse, women's lacrosse leading 9-4 to four as they get close to the half. McHenry with two, Fiora with two, Dabitska still with three. That one's going to be lined into the gap between short. It's a base hit. Coming around third and trying to score, and he will, is Rivera. Moving up to second is Keller. And a nice RBI. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Keller was thrown out there. <laughs> Didn't look like he was thrown out. I thought he got in there. So Keller's going to get an RBI single. He's thrown out at second. Run scores in Rivera. So Post does get an insurance run. But Brennan Holligan is going to go out there to try and get the complete game. Right after this break here on the CACC Network. So Post gets the much-needed insurance run as we head to the top of the seventh. They lead 3-0. Because like Grace mentioned in like the third or fourth inning, I don't even remember at this point. <laughs> Two, I don't even remember it now. I already forgot. We've talked about it so much. <laughs> I'm going to guess. I think it was the fourth inning probably. No, I don't remember what you said. <laughs> about what? Game that one's over? chopped back to Holligan. Crane... It's going to be retired for the first out Here of the go. seventh. No, about about two two uh oh, the, the two goal lead. Oh yeah, it's the most dangerous lead. The in most hockey. dangerous lead, right? Yeah, because you think you got it in the bag, and then it can just not be Escape in the bag. <laughs> yeah. So Holligan, two outs away from doing this and getting a shutout. That would be fourteen <laughs> straight shutout innings for Post. Two straight shutout wins, third this year, if they can hold on. Pitches outside the Hooth. 1-0 the count. one -oh. Outside. Ball two. Defensive alignment still the same out there for Post. Had a few changes earlier in the game to Chestnut Hill. Holligan fires. That one's chopped over to Cornwell at short. He fields. Fires in time. Two down. As we're about to reach the 5 o'clock hour. Hey, Jack, this is going to work out perfectly for you. Jack, our <laughs> GA, has class at 6. He said he had to leave at 5. And as long as Brendan Holligan can get the out in the next few minutes, Jack will have not missed a second of Eagles baseball action today. Holligan delivers the first pitch, swung out and fouled off by Peluso. I wonder if those balls can reach the road from here if they hit it at the right angle. Oh, they can. 100%. It's fouled off to, by Peluso, and that, I, that, that one might have. I don't even know. <laughs> So Holligan, one strike away from the complete game. It would be the second complete game of the afternoon for Post. That one pitch is high, one and two. He's at 80 pitches coming into this at bat, so he will finish with 84 if he gets the out here. And we'll try and get an interview with him and Matt Seaman, who had the no-hitter in game number one. Yeah, pitch is outside, counts Jinxed two it. and two. Jinxed it. I was just saying, this is how many pitches he would finish at. I didn't look. If if, if anything was going to be a jinx, it was going to be me saying that we had a no hitter last game. So, yeah. 
I didn't jinx that. Holligan fires outside for ball three. No one really stirring in the bullpen. I, Jake Bauman was soft tossing earlier. I do see somebody is tossing, but I can't see them around the shed. And it's not going to matter. Brennan Holligan gets the final out of the game. Peluso down on strikes. The Eagles get the sweep swooping in to Municipal with the two wins over the Griffins. 3 nothing in this one, 4 nothing in game number one, a no-hitter. Keep it here for a little while because we are going to try and interview Matt Seaman and Brennan Holligan as soon as we possibly can get them up here. But Grace, do you have any final words about your experience today? Um, I like that it's a slow-paced game to talk through, you know? I definitely couldn't do basketball <laughs> like I, you asked a few weeks ago, so... It did seem to go by a lot faster. Oh, yeah. Too. Yeah. Always helps to have someone talking. It does. <laughs> so we're going to cut it for a little bit. Don't go anywhere, though. We're going to have a couple interviews coming up here on the CACC Network.
Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Test, test, test.
All right, so we're here with Game 2 starter Brennan Holligan. Brennan, you just had a seven-inning shutout performance, second game with this doubleheader. What does this win mean for you guys, getting this doubleheader sweep? Um, ultimately, it's a huge win. You know, we're starting the spring up right now, so we went strong. Last series in the conference against Felicia, 1-2, got the sweep here. So ultimately, you know, it's a huge win for the boys. What was working for you well on the mound today? Obviously, it's a shutout win for you. You go seven strong innings. What was working well with your pitches and against these Chestnut Hill hitters? Oh, yes, sir. Ultimately, it was it was mostly just my heater and then throwing that slider off the heater to help with that. So ultimately, that's what helped me out out there. Eight days off before you play, play Dominican right back here at home. You have three games against Dominican. How do you guys prepare for that with this week off now? So... We'll probably have some off time. Let's see. I know that the boys who played this this uh, this game, we got weights later on in the week. So early on, we'll have some off time, and then we'll get back in it later on in the week. So that's Brennan Holligan, Game 2 starter, got the win here. Now we're going to bring in Matt Seaman, our Game 1 starter, who had the first official no-hitter in program history. We did some fact-checking on it between games, and we talked to former head coach A.J. McNamara, who said that they had a pitcher go five innings back in 2009 and get a no-hitter. But that's a lot different from getting a seven-inning no-hitter. What does that mean to know that you're the first official pitcher to get a no-hitter in program history? Uh, it feels good. Uh, I feel like it, you know, it's just an example for the rest of our guys. Uh, you know, Halligan came out right after that and backed it up with a great performance. Um, and, you know, as an older guy on the staff, I just do what I can do to get us some wins and set an example for the rest of the guys. I noticed this from up here. I don't know if you were doing it at all or if you noticed it, but I noticed that you started to slow down as you were pitching. The early innings, it seemed like you were working really quick, and that's where you were a little out of control. It seemed like some of your breaking pitches weren't breaking where you wanted. But as the game rolled on, it seemed like you slowed down your pitching style, and those breaking pitches were starting to hit. What changed as the innings went on? Because you had a lot of hit batters and walks in the first two, three innings. But then it seemed like you settled down those last four or five innings. Uh, I would say just, I mean, I probably slowed down because I was a little tired, uh, so I needed to catch a breath between pitches. Um, but, you know, just in between pitches, taking a breath, refocusing myself, I think that was the key for me, not to make two bad pitches in a row, you know? Did you know that you had a no-hitter going? I know that was that questionable call, and the, the, I was scoring the game at short with Evan, and I reviewed it, and I'm like, well, that wasn't as bang-bang as I thought, so I had changed it right away to an error in that same inning. But did you have any clue that you had a no-hitter going? Uh, yeah, I knew. Um, at when, when After that inning, uh, I came in, I was talking to Bank, and I was like, it might have been the fourth inning. I was like, yo, they're going to change that to uh, an error, right? He's like, yeah, it was definitely an error. And I was like, all right. And they were talking to me about, you know, I need to limit my pitches in the sixth not to go have a long-winded inning. And I just came out there for the sixth inning, threw the ball right down the middle, hopefully got some quick outs. And then seventh inning, I was just not going to give up the hit there. Was the plan to go the set, the full seventh no matter what, or was the plan for you to be coming out if you, like, had given up that one hit? Uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure he would have taken me out in the seventh if I had given up a hit. But um, in the past, Gold has pushed me to seven innings um, when I can do it. What was the celebration like to have with your team? And obviously, you have to readjust right away. So now you kind of can celebrate now that you got the doubleheader sweep. But what was that moment like to have all your teammates mob you out there on the field? It was great. Um, I actually, when I was younger, um, Mikey Pavlicek, who was the right fielder, he was. He's actually been in the outfield for both a no hitter and a perfect game I've thrown in my life. My only two, so it's great in college to you know have him here for that. And immediately the first guy I saw hugging me was my brother, um, who's also on the team, which was a great feeling. I mean, haven't felt something like that in a long time. Four and one to start conference play now. How do you guys keep the ball rolling with this week off? Uh, you know we're gonna get a couple of good lifts in. Um, we're gonna keep our heads down, keep working. Uh, and we got a bunch of guys that are going to go out there and pitch well and do their job. Matt Seaman with us. No hitter, the first in program history for Post. We thank you for joining us today for this double header of baseball. Two seven inning wins for Post University over Chestnut Hill. Two shutout wins. We'll see you next Wednesday against Dominican University.